Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on African News Tonight. It doesn't represent the, what Nigerians expected at the end. And you can see it from almost every Nigerian you come across. There's this, you know, down spirit. You know, our spirit has been damped, you know. That's a Nigerian voter expressing anger over the announcement that Ahmed Bola Tinubu won Saturday's presidential election. Details coming up. Also, the United Nations addresses humanitarian needs on the continent. And a familiar face enters Ghana's presidential race. These stories and more on African News tonight. Our top story, former Ghanaian President John Mahama launched his campaign today to recapture the post he held from 2012 to 2017. Bahama has run for Ghana's highest office three times, losing in the last two elections to current president Nana akufo Addo. Mahama's campaign begins as Ghana's struggling economy is the country's top concern. Kent Mensa reports from Accra, Ghana. The atmosphere was filled with the blaring sounds of Vuzeles amid drumming and dancing as hundreds of supporters of the former president packed themselves in the auditorium in the Volta region, a stronghold of the opposition National Democratic Congress, NDC party. Dressed in an all-white outfit, a color that signifies victory in Ghana, John Mama argued that Ghana's current situation requires a leader with experience like him. Ghana needs experience and not experiments. Ghana needs a leader who will hit the ground running on 7th January 2025. Ghana needs a leader who will not be given an orientation and excursion through the Flagstaff House. Ghana used to be the shining light on the continent of Africa, and I'm of the strongest conviction that we can attain those heights again. I believe it, and we will lead by example. Mama said the current government has failed Ghanaians, leading to the current economic hardship in the West African country. This government has been clueless, and in many ways, Carlos, the unthinkable has happened, and our country today is broken on all fronts. Ghana is bankrupt. We are saddled with debts we simply cannot pay, and we have suffered the global humiliation of defaulting on our debts and being downgraded by all credit rating agencies to the lowest level ever seen in our history. Ghana is facing its worst economic and financial crisis in decades with an annual inflation rate of 53.6% in January. The cost of living and fuel prices are high in the West African country, and Ghana recently applied to the International Monetary Fund for a $3 billion relief package to help revive the economy. Speaking to VOA News, Peter Mark Menu, a former national chairman of the governing New Patriotic Party, NPP, and the 2020 campaign manager of President Akufuado said, the 64-year-old Mahama has nothing new to offer Ghanaians. Mahama is not bringing anything new into the elections. And we know how he ran the affairs of this country when he had the opportunity. And his records is nothing to write home about. So nobody is scared of Mahama at all. We get the economy right. And I believe we'll get it right. Mahama is no force. Kwame Asa Asante, the director of the Center for European Studies at the University of Ghana, told Viewe the opposition NDC is in a better position to return to power with Mahama as its flag bearer. NDC has a brighter chance, uh, especially with Mahama. Mahama stands tall in terms of experience, record uh, that he has left in this country, and in terms of popularity. These three, three things will go a long way to strengthen the chances of winning the flag bearership. Mahama has the ideas uh, because he has seen it before, he has experience, and he has done it before. On May 13, NDC leaders will meet to elect their standard bearer ahead of the 2024 elections. Mahama will be contesting three others, including a former finance minister and governor of the central bank, Kobna Dufour. The general election is still more than 20 months away on December 7, 2024. Kent Mensa for VOA News, Accra, Ghana. 
Nigeria's ruling All Progressive Congress uh, APC candidate Ahmed Bola Tinubu yesterday was declared the winner of the presidential election. Opposition parties say the electronic voting system's failure to upload tallies allowed for ballot manipulation and disparities in the results from the manual counts at polling stations. Our Abuja Bureau coordinator, Mandina Daoud, says the opposition is set on mounting a spirited legal challenge to the results. What we are seeing is a different kind of reaction, actually, from both sides. There are protests going on, pockets of protests going on, most especially in the federal capital, Abuja. In other places, you find women protesting. That is where the Labour Party has majority of votes. Women and youth are protesting on behalf of the Labour Party. In other places, you find men, elderly people, and young ones also protesting on behalf of the other opposition party, which is the PDP. But the protest is not an overall thing, as we're talking with you. Uh, You just find pockets of them happening everywhere. And then you never can rule out, you know, the social media, where there is so much write-up about this election. Half are praising it, half are supporting what the Independent National Electoral Commission did, the machine that is going to be used to transmit this election result from the polling unit to the INEX server. But as it is now, the stories we're getting are that the beavers are not used in transmitting results from the polling unit to the INEX server. So that is what is making people agitated. Everybody is questioning why would this beavers machine that was proclaimed to be the best before the elections suddenly collapse during the elections and cannot transmit the election results from polling units to the INEX server. That is actually what is making people question the credibility of these elections. It's so ironic uh, that Nigerian Electoral Commission introduced this, uh, what uh, you're talking about now, the biometric voter identification technology for the first time at the national level and a portal for uploading election results to improve transparency, but it seems to have backfired. And I guess that's why the opposition and its supporters uh, are saying the system's failures to upload the tallies allowed for ballot manipulation and disparities in the results for the manual counts at polling stations. Very, very ironic, because right from the beginning, this issue of transmitting election results technologically or through the Beavers machine brought a lot of problems at the National Assembly, like when the uh, Electoral Act 2022 was going to be passed. Half of the National Assembly for the House of Reps and the Senate were always rowdy about the mode of transmitting electoral results. Until the Electoral Act was approved, there were still questions as to if Nigeria is technologically advanced enough to be able to transmit election results through the, the Internet. Now, because of that, Medina, the opposition is set to mount a spirit, uh, the impending challenge. The two main opposition parties, that is the People's Democratic Party, where the former vice president contested Tiko Abubakar, is challenging the outcome of this election in court. So also, the Labour Party, where the former Anambra State governor, Dr. Peter Obi, contested, is also challenging the validity of this result in court. So we are waiting for them to file their cases. But so far, we have received uh, their petitions that they have sent to the United Nations and to many, many other observers, the EU, like the ECOWAS, the Africa Union, they have sent petitions to all of these observer groups asking that, asking their support that they want to challenge the validity of this election in court. And they would want the support of all of these organizations that have come personally to observe the elections. That was Medina Dauda with VOA's House of Service. She spoke earlier today from our office in Abuja. Nigerians are starting to move from Saturday's election, but as VOA's Peter Cloti 
found out. Many voters say they are disappointed by the announcement that Ahmed Bola Tinubu won the presidential election. Many are frustrated with the slow pace of the vote counting and problems with the electronic voting system. Here are the thoughts of two people Peter spoke with yesterday in Abuja. My name is Ken Amanze. What is your reaction following the official declaration of Asiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu as president-elect of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Uh, Personally, I feel uh, disappointed as a Nigerian. Why? Um, Because, I mean, the whole world saw the elections. Um, Observers were around. Um, The people came out in mass hoping that their votes would count. And at the end of the day, it turned out to be what I'll call a sham. Why? Uh, I mean, just imagine you put in uh, hot water to make tea and then you're getting fruit juice. How would you feel? So you think the election is just a fruit juice? <laughs> well, I think it's just a sham. It's, I mean, it was a scam. I mean, this, this doesn't represent the, what Nigerians expected at the end. And you can see it from almost every Nigerian you come across. There's this, you know, down spirit. You know, our spirit has been damped, you know. And um, it just tells you what we all feel, how we all feel. But the electoral law has provisions to address issues of that. The INEC chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, asked these aggrieved parties to present evidence to him in order to consider some of their issues. The electoral law also provides that you go to court to seek legal redress if you are aggrieved. What do you, why do you think these politicians are, are not doing so? In the first instance, for the INEC chairman or the INEC to make such statements as going to court and all of this, it shouldn't be, be to be said in the first in- instance. For example, um, if the electoral process worked effectively, he will mention that. If the votes were counted appropriately, he will mention that. If they were uploaded on time, as promised. I mean, he had four years. He had over 300 billion to, to make this election work. Naira. In Naira. And he still failed. So, in essence, what are you talking about? So, this statement he's making is, is like putting salt on, on injury. So, he, I mean, he shouldn't get to that point. He should get to the point where he says, these are the actual results, these are the winners, and this is your president elect. I'm Gloria by name. Your and last name? Akbana Gloria. All right, so, Gloria. A, a winner has been declared by INEC. Asiwa Jubola Ahmed Tinubu is now officially president-elect. Your reaction to the election results and the declaration of the winner? It's, it's like the reaction is... I can't even express myself because it's too much. How would they declare um, Bola Tinubu as the winner of which me, myself, I did not even vote him? The whole Nigeria, everybody, we are angry. We woke up this morning to discover that the Nigeria was forever that declared um, Bola Tinubu as, as the winner of a presidential election. How, is, how come? Why all the voting everywhere that we check around? It's not in my own unit. No any place that Bola Tinubu won the election, but... Fortunately, coming this morning, check this morning, everything comes to our but, but, but there are a lot of yeah. other states that voted for him. Apart from other states, yes, there are a lot of other states that voted for him, but he did not come forth. He did not come as the first position there, neither second. He's even the first position coming. So why will you come and say, okay, now you are the first person to go? It's, it's, it doesn't work that way. So for, so, we're angry. so for the youth who are angry, what message will you send to them? They, they should let the justice be made. Let it be made, no matter how it is. Let justice work. What does that mean? Explain to us. We want, we want our vote to count. Our vote is not counting. It's not, what we vote is different in Italy. We want our vote to count. Those were voters in Abuja talking with VOA's Peter Cloti about the country's presidential election. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Tunisian tennis star Ons Jabour is speaking out against discrimination a week after President Kais Saeed ordered urgent measures against sub-Saharan migrants, including mass evictions. Last week, he said they are bringing violence and crime to the country and are part of a criminal plot to change Tunisia's demographic makeup. According to the French news agency AFP yesterday, Jabour tweeted, Today is hashtag Zero Discrimination Day. She said, quote, as a proud Tunisian, Arab and African woman, I celebrate the right of everyone to live with dignity. 
Another Tunisian sports figure, football star Radi Jaidi, has voiced solidarity with the migrants, posting, I am African, not just because I was born in Africa, but because Africa was born in me. Jaidi comes from the black community, which makes up a tenth of Tunisia's 12 million people. AFP says hundreds of West Africans have been evicted in recent days by landlords, fearing heavy fines for hosting undocumented migrants. Many of those evicted have flocked to their embassies for repatriation. Ivory Coast and Guinea have began evacuating their citizens. Tunisian President Kais Saeed's comments about migrants from sub-Saharan Africa led hundreds of protesters to take to the streets of the capital recently. Ahmed Galoul is the former Tunisian Minister of Youth and Sports. He spoke with VOA senior analyst Mohamed al Shanawi about why he thinks Saeed has spoken against migrants. Actually, this is a dramatic event which, which is happening in Tunisia. This has never happened during the modern history of Tunisia, such an event, such a blunt racist declaration from a head of state. We do have black Tunisian citizens in Tunisia, and actually the number of African who are in Tunisia, it doesn't go beyond 22,000. So for a president of a country to get on a national TV and to say that there is a plot, to change the demographic map of the country, it is something quite radical. It is worth noting that such a declaration came after a wave of propaganda on social media trying to create a scapegoat and this type of fear that there is a danger coming from the sub-Saharan region. And those Africans who are with us are trying to change the religion of the country and they represent a danger. So in my view, what is happening is just a propaganda campaign and creation of a scapegoat in a time of crisis. And this crisis is actually the failure of Qais Saeed, the failure of his roadmap, his failure in convincing the Tunisian population about his program. If you are aware, during the last elections, less than 10% of the Tunisian population have participated in Qais Saeed's election. So that is why he needs to create a scapegoat while the protesters shouted no to racism, solidarity with migrants, and no to police crackdown, President Qais Saeed said earlier this week that urgent measures were needed to address the entry of irregular immigrants from sub-Saharan countries with their lot of violence, crimes, and unacceptable practices. Are the Tunisian people concerned about illegal immigrants and approve a crackdown against them? I don't think that there is an issue of illegal immigrants in Tunisia. Actually, those black Africans, because we Tunisians, we are Africans, actually our name is Afriqiya. So the name of the continent is, we take our name from the continent. So we are Africans and we are white and brown and black Africans. We live together. And those immigrants who are coming in Tunisia, they are helping a lot of business in Tunisia. Because many of them are hard workers, and they are not many. They're just 20,000. How could 20,000 person, individual, represent a danger for the country? So no, the Tunisian people are not worried about this. Most of them, and and I do know that during the last few years, they consider a solution for many businesses because they are hard workers, they work, and they help. And there is no issue about illegal immigrants in the country. And why should they still be illegal immigrants? They should, we should facilitate their stay in the country. Why should we put them as a, as a problem while they are part of the solution of the country? That was Ahmed Galoul, the former Tunisian Minister of Youth and Sports. He was speaking with my colleague, Mohamed al Shanawi. The United Nations is providing support to people that continue to be impacted by the conflict in Ethiopia, unrest in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, and tropical cyclone Freddy in Madagascar. VOA's Ignatius Anor has the details. In Ethiopia, the UN says the eastern and southern regions of the nation continue to bail under the impact of devastating drought. UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric says some of these people are coping with the cholera outbreak, at least 
1,100 cases have been recorded. We, along with our partners and the government, uh, launched an appeal for nearly $4 billion to reach more than 20 million people in Ethiopia this year with critical assistance, including food, nutrition support, health services, and other vital aid. In northern Ethiopia, the UN noted improvements in access to humanitarian aid after a deal to end hostilities by warring parties. Since mid-November, the global body says it has sent nearly 180,000 tons of food and other aid to Tigray, adding that more than 8.5 million people are now targeted for food assistance across Afar, Amhara and Tigray. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, clashes between the Congolese army and the M23 rebels continue in the east of the country, according to the United Nations. Dujaric says assisting people coping with Cyclone Freddy is a challenge. In Madagascar, we are also continuing to support the government to help people impacted by Tropical Cyclone Freddy. At least 226,000 people were impacted, including 150,000 who are in need of humanitarian assistance. The number of people displaced by the cyclone has increased to nearly 38,000, according to the authorities. Hundreds of schools have been damaged, as well as health centers. The UN Secretary General spokesperson also paid tribute to three soldiers from Senegal who died last week when their convoy was hit by explosive device. Ignatius Anno, VOA News, Washington.